Welcome to Clearing the Clutter Inside and Out with Julie Caraccio. Every Tuesday at 1 p.m., Julie interviews experts on all areas of clutter, physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional. A clutter coach and professional organizer, Julie also offers tips to help you get clutter-free for a more joyful and fulfilling life. Today's show is sponsored by My Wardrobe Genie. My Wardrobe Genie is an easy, affordable way to organize clothes in your closet and make the clothing you want to wear easy to find in an organized closet when you want it. It means feeling good about what you select from your closet to wear each day. For more information, please visit allsetsolutions.com. So excited we're going to be talking about creativity today. When I've worked with a lot of people, Clutter, in my view, can stop and hinder creativity. So we're going to talk to a creativity expert. We'll see if I've been right about that and what tips she might have to offer. And I'd like to tell you about Katrina. Katrina Fancook has a passion for guiding others to shift their perception about their natural creative gifts and live more in the creative flow. She does this through teaching, coaching, and supporting people with practical tools, enabling people to look at themselves and the world around them differently. Katrina identifies creative blocks and fears, then helps you find ways to tune into your unique creative flow every day to move past them. Her experience as a professional writer and creativity consultant, combined with her intuitive gifts and training as a Reiki master and healer, enable her to guide you through personal development challenges while offering you clear explanations of what's happening and how to shift it. No matter where what you're looking to create in your business or life is coming from an honest, creative, passionate space within. Good morning, Katrina. Good morning, Julie. It's really nice to be here and chat with you today. Well, I'm so excited because I think that this is such an important uh, topic. Now, it's been my view when I've worked with people that clutter interferes with the creative process. But, you know, one of the things that you do is help people break through those. So first, do you agree with that? Is that a fair statement? Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. I talked with someone recently that even though she was creating, she was creating lots of projects and then basically surrounding herself in clutter of her own projects. So yeah, I mean, you can have that clutter inside and then not fully express that. And then you have your art surrounding you or your project surrounding you and that can be equally stressful and cluttery. So I absolutely agree with you. How do you think from a, since you really get down to the nitty gritty, an example I would use is I was working with a writer once and, and it, it's kind of similar to what you said as far as having all these projects and maybe not completing them or getting them done. But one thing I noticed was sphere. It was my perception that we could ha have clutter and have all these projects going on and not complete anything because there was a fear of success. And, you know, a lot of people at first when you say, they'd be like, oh my gosh, no, absolutely not. But that was my observation as we dug a little deeper, she ended up agreeing with that. What are your thoughts? I think that is definitely a factor when people are getting to that point where they almost finish something and then leave it. Um, there's a fear there and then I think there's also those inner patterns that we grew up with. Maybe we had a parent that said, well, I don't really value that kind of creative expression or I don't necessarily support your creative self expression and that can sometimes in the background be poking at you you really don't even realize that it's there and it could be something that was actually truthful that what they said specifically or it could just be something that you internalize and sort of transformed into that sort of you know background noise so it's really important to sort of look at all of those angles it's how did you grow up what kind of messages were you getting there? And then what is your view of success? I mean, do, I'm sure you work with so many people that aren't, they want to be successful, but if you ask them what success looks like and what that means, maybe they can't really tell you off the bat. They're, they're very unclear on what that should be. Oh, that's an excellent point, and I, I appreciate it because that fear of, of success could come from something that they were told in childhood. Now, I, I've also been my observation that sometimes a fear of failure prevents people from, from being creative. Are there any other common, uh, not ailments, common things that you found that have mm -hmm. stopped people, or when you work with them, found like, oh, this is what the block is? I definitely feel that people have an expectation. If they are feeling like, if I was creative, my creativity would look like this. Ah. If I was creative, I would be a painter, 
or a writer or a sculptor and they just have a very narrow definition of what creativity is to them which really what room do they have to grow in that what room do they have to show up and actually be themselves and creatively express who they are if that definition and that expectation on themselves is very narrow I so read I say, a... sorry go ahead no I was going to say definitely expectations and they, they sort of sprout in from everywhere so you gotta keep an eye on that as well I read a really interesting article in our Sunday paper yesterday, and there's a guy locally who brings a typewriter, which is great. How often do you see a typewriter these days? <laughs> brings a typewriter to the coffee house, and what he does, and he'll announce, okay, this month I'm going to be at this coffee house, and for $5, he creates a poem for you, and he sits at his typewriter, and he said, I just blam it out. It usually takes me 15 minutes, and if there's a typo, that's part of the charm, and he said, you know, it, people he say one word, anger, write a poem about that, or one like the cat that scratched me. And in 15 <laughs> minutes, five bucks, he created, and I thought, that's really clever. I mean, it's using a typewriter, and it's just something different. And what he said, which I thought was really interesting, he said, you know, I, I don't have to make my living doing this. I can be passionate about this and use my creativity in a way that satisfies me. Mm-hmm. Because think of how many people in the world are unsatisfied with their work or they feel unfulfilled in some way. And you're getting into a different sort of perception of what you feel creativity is when you meld that with how you make a living, right? Those expectations grow even more and that's even heavier. But before I get too far away from what you, the story you just said, like I got goosebumps when you said that because that's such a cool way to not only express his creativity, but also share that. And, you know, that's, for me, I think that's one of the more important things that people miss with creativity. It's, there's, there's something to be said for creating something for you that fulfills something within you, but it expands so much further when you're actually able to share it in a way that makes other people happy too, or influences people in another way. And, you know, those people spent $5, but how awesome did they feel, right? It gave them a little pep to their day. <laughs> <laughs> right. Absolutely. And I thought it was really clever. And again, that kind of ties in to your great point earlier of the expectations. Well, if I'm creative, I have to make a living doing this or I have to be a New York's best time seller. And, you know, an example that I use, my mother discovered probably it's been maybe 10, 12 years ago that she had a talent for painting. And so she paints, it's the one time she slows down and she enjoys it and she's, you know what, she's pretty good. She gives a painting to three charities she really likes and so they auction off and make money and, and you know, I'm like, hey, create a website, you know, you can sell those and she's like, oh, maybe, but she gives away a lot of the paintings but it brings her so much joy. Now, in my mind, I mm -hmm. refer to her as a painter and someone else might say, well, no, that's not her full-time occupation but it brings her joy and it brings people who buy her paintings or get a painting joy. Sure. Well, and what a great invitation to change actually how we share what our gifts in the world. I think a lot of times it's such a narrow explanation because other people can't understand like, well, you're an accountant, so I get what that is. But you're an accountant that kind of paints sometimes, but your paintings are good enough that you could sell. So are you a painting, a painter, or an accountant? Like, we're... Where are you falling on the spectrum here? And I think we just have to get more used to the fact that we're multi-talented in a lot of different ways. And just because you're doing one thing doesn't mean that's how you have to define yourself in a creative way either. Absolutely. Now, since you work so intimately with people on the subject of creativity, have you can tell us some ways that when removing clutter has mm -hmm. helped people and the creativity and, and I use that very broadly because on this show it's mental, spiritual, physical and emotional and I would love to share you have you share your thoughts on that. Absolutely. For me, I mean and you'll see this if you if you check out my website as well, that creativity is the, a mind body spirit interaction. There's just, you know, the more that you can kind of address all of those things or embrace all of those things when you're looking at your creativity, the more balanced and fulfilled you'll actually feel and be. Now as far as specific blocks, I think the first thing is, and we've kind of talked about it a little bit already, it's like what are your expectations? Are you wanting to just show up and have fun with your creative self? Um, are you implementing little things throughout the day so that you have a break? Are you taking a little bit of time every day to even just be outside, walk in nature, do something that refreshes you? Because as a culture, I think Americans especially drain themselves. And then they wonder at the end of the day why they feel too tired to do anything that really fills their heart. So it's really important to take that time a little bit in the day. And I get it. People have kids. 
people have full-time jobs. But, you know, find 15, 20 minutes. It doesn't have to be some big, huge, grand gesture. And I think that's where people get hung up. They, they want it to be this huge, big expression when it just has to be something a little bit every day. Um, let me think of some other really quick ones. Uh, I feel that if you can at least be honest with yourself a little bit, too, when you are stuck, I think a lot of times, you know, people get a little frustrated with themselves. Try to give yourself a, you know, a little more self-care. I think the self-care aspect is really missing in, in a lot of the creative expression of today as well. Because if you think about if you're trying to balance your mind, body, and spirit, self-care is a big part of that. It's and I really also think in this 24-7 society, there's a pressure. It doesn't matter if you're creative or your art. Get it out. Sell it. Make the money. Yes. And that there's this. And it's been my observation that you need time to to go underneath what was the Greek mythology persona who spent six months underground or whatever but that you need a rest and then when you get that rest you're rejuvenated and have more ideas yes absolutely well and you know a long time ago I decided that I was going to do intentions for the full moon and the new moon and the reason I mentioned that it's because I think that there's sort of that twice a month where I'm built in to you know, for the full moon, you do release intentions, and for the new moon, you do basically goal setting or other intentions of things that you want to create. And I sort of just built that in so I know, okay, this is twice a month where I get an opportunity to allow myself to do that because I am busy, and you might not remember. And then this way, I know that every, like twice a month, I'm actually acknowledging those things that no longer serve me. So that would be one of the other aspects of creative clutter is that, well, what do you have laying around? What relationships are still sort of lingering, but they're not really supportive or not really helpful, and how is that draining your energy? Or projects that are half done, is there something that you can commit to finishing? Or lovingly put in the closet knowing that you'll get to it someday, but that's okay. It's not something that's, you know, draining your energy. And those are some at least basic blocks that I see happen to a lot of folks is they don't really understand where their energy drains are coming from. And then they don't take the time with the self-care to fill themselves back up. Now, what would you say to people, and that's been my observation, again, it depends on what level of clutter and what's going on in your life, but it's usually a process. It's not just going to snap your fingers and happen overnight. But what advice would you have for someone who's like, okay, I'm starting to tackle these areas of clutter, but I still want to be creative. What would you say to them? I would say figure out what your prime time is to create in the day. For me, I'm an afternoon person. I get up in the morning, I do my emails, I get kind of de decluttered, kind of get all the other stuff out of the way, but I know that my best creative time is in the afternoon. So if you can actually be still or sort of figure out when you can maximize that time, then you can start to sort of arrange your schedule around ways that will actually support you in that. So, you know, if you're not a morning person, don't say, I'm going to get up every day and write 10 minutes worth <laughs> of, you know, whatever. It's just, it's, you're just setting yourself up for failure that way, right? So it's very important to kind of know you first. Um, and then in terms of just the specific clutter for things that you already have in progress or things that are going on that maybe are distracting, uh, I think it's really about what commitments are you ready to make for yourself, right? Because if there's one important goal that you want to meet, I think it's easier to sort of work towards that rather than saying, I want to do these 10 things. I want these 10 goals to be accomplished. Again, it's that same sort of thing. It's like set yourself up for success by creating, you know, that space where not only you're getting the self-care, but you're focused on one goal of finishing something that's going to make you feel really good. Um, I know that even for a lot of people that are very in their head, um, staying away from a specific goal altogether can be stressful for them because they want to feel that sense of achievement. So I, I would say even for them, just having that, that one goal but leaving it rather loose can be helpful too because then if you make it too specific, again, you come back to the expectations of, well, this just didn't come out how I was expecting it to, and that's because the goal's a little too tight. Now, I would love your thoughts on, I consider myself creative in writing and a couple other areas, but I can't tell you, for so much of my life, I was told I was too sensitive. And I believe a lot of creative types are told that, or you've probably heard the term, oh, she's an artist. You know those artist types. Now, it, for me, that was always very negative. And it, it, looking back on it, I can say, you know what, that was real emotional clutter for me because I saw it being sensitive as negative. 
And so I think, what would you say to that, if you have thoughts on that for people who are struggling with that? Oh, I hear that all the time. I'm the artist. I'm too sensitive. I love that you asked this question because I think it's something that holds a lot of people back and helps, basically makes them feel as if their gift is more of like a curse, right? It's almost yeah. like, well, if you're too sensitive, how are you going to function in the real world kind of thing? Um, I grew up my whole life in the same way. I didn't realize that I was intuitive. I didn't realize that I had these creative abilities and that my sensitivity was part of that. So my advice to people would be to, you know, again, it's, it's about sitting with what you know you are and doing your best to sort of look at, okay, this is how I feel. What is this external sort of stuff kind of coming at me? What, what are the things that scare me the most? What are the beliefs that I have? And sort of getting them out on paper, I feel, really helps people, just journaling them or writing them down. And then you can look at them objectively and be like, hey, you know, this does this really ring true for me? Is that really something I've told myself? Or is this something else that I've heard from other people? I also think in the last five to ten years especially, there's been a lot more attention around highly sensitive people. Um, and I think for just educating yourself about maybe getting some books on it. There's certainly, uh, I know that there's definitely one, I can't remember the, the title of it right now, that's specifically for highly sensitive people, but doing a little bit of research or talking to other people, I think is an important part of that. And, you know, as a, as a creative artist or a creative person, if someone tells you that you're sensitive, say thank you. It's part of what helps me be more expressive and share more of me in the world. And I think it's, it definitely is about that mindset that we have for ourselves, but, you know, I think the, I don't like the idea that people feel that art, artists or creative folks aren't grounded. Yes. That's the part, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that does still irritate me a little bit because I think the sensitive part is one half, but they also feel that maybe, you know, artists are a little bit too out there. And, and it's only because their concepts come to them when they're tuned in. And there isn't a prescription. It's like, I'm taking this time. This is what came to me today. That's awesome. Um, and they're just more open to the flow, and that I think that makes people that aren't necessarily there yet for themselves a little uncomfortable. At least that's been my experience. So they try to make you more like them. I think that's very true, and I do that now. Thank you. And another shift that I had from interviewing someone who actually wasn't a, a conversation on creativity or art is that I'm aware. I don't use the term sensitive anymore. I'm aware. So I'm more aware. And that to me is a more positive way to do it. And I think, hey, I'm more aware. I'm more tuned in. So that's, you know, my was my personal shift to embrace it instead of it seeing it as something really negative is is at which I still think most of our society does. Now this might be I a little that. go ahead. I was gonna say I love that. Well and I mean let's just think of it. You're using all your senses at the same time. Yes. You know, some people can only use one sense at a time. I think you know, creative people or more sensitive people are really getting input from all five senses simultaneously, so it takes us a little, a little bit more time to be like, okay, I'm feeling lots of stuff. Where is this coming from? Now, I'd love it if you have, and this might be a little out of your realm. I'll use an example that I use, but since you work with helping people get unstuck from all their creativity blocks, for people who do a bunch of different projects, I've recommended if you have been in... Uh, a, a corporation they have you know those mail slots so you each get a little slot that's it mm -hmm. they're huge and so one would say Katrina and Julie and then the person would put your mail in and you that was where you'd go like mm -hmm. a mail sorter I think yeah. those are great if you're working on a bunch of different projects you can pull the shelves out so you have a bunch of areas so it's not cluttered but it keeps the project together mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if you have have maybe tips for removing physical clutter to help for very creative types. I think that's a fantastic idea and what I love about that is that you might be working on one project and get an idea on another so you can write a note down real quick and put it in the right box so all of your notes are together. Right. Um, I will say this, I, I have some a similar sort of a system but I use folders uh, different colored folders so I kind of organize it in the same way but you know for current projects things that I'm working on there uh, but I will say that I'm probably a little messier <laughs> than most people because I, I do get a lot of ideas when I'm working on one project for another thing so I am a little terrible with the post-it note stuff so I'll have scraps of paper in lots of places at the end of the day I do make sure to organize my piles though 
Um, so I think it's also about, you know, some people, let's face, you know, are very um, organized online, right? So maybe instead of doing something that's a physical mailbox, they open up a Google document and they've got a list of stuff in there. Or they open up a document that's for a specific project, let's say. Or a Word document, or whatever works for you. Um, I definitely use Google Keep on my phone, too, because if I'm taking a walk, and I come up with an idea, I like to put an idea in there. So any way that you could kind of mix together the technology piece with the, the, the hard, you know, physical movement piece of clutter, I think is very helpful too. Um, I just think that the trick is at the end of the day, okay, so do you have like every three months you kind of work through, you know, you kind of review all of your organization. I mean, you seem like a very diligent lady, so you're probably like, okay, this project's done, but you know, sometimes things like with clients or whatever don't really come to a very specific end or maybe you're kind of hanging on for a little bit. So, you know, I think adding in maybe at the end of the month or every couple months you go through and sort of sort through your folders or whatever documents you've created and, and kind of remove that clutter too. Excellent. You heard it from the creative person, not just the, the organizer person, because I think that's really important. One shift that I've made is mm -hmm. doing the show and a couple other projects. I do things with notebooks. So I have a master list. Okay, I know, for instance, I'm going to have to edit this video when we finish today. So it's on my master list. But you know what? I, I can tell you right now, I'm not going to do this right afterwards because I don't have the energy. The cat got me up in the middle of the night, so I'm not, you know, not where I need to be. But if I know, okay, Thursday, wow, I'm really feeling that creative moment to edit together her video. And so I put all my projects down and try to really get in tune with myself. Okay, what are you what are you feeling like working on today and kind of trying to honor that spirit and again life happens you have to schedule clients you have to do certain things but what I found that gets me into a rhythm when I'm able to do that and again to honor being in the present moment and and I feel when you're in the present moment at least for me that allows you to open up for more creative uh, guidance Yes, and what I love about the fact that you ask yourself that is that you're giving yourself permission to say no. No, now isn't the right time, but I trust that later it will be. And that is how you create more of an inner dialogue with yourself, right? Because no, you go to a job every day, there's a set number of things that you have to do and you're under pressure. But if you're in a specific place where you're kind of working through your own creativity, you have control of that in sense of permission in terms of saying, yes, now is the time or now I don't feel like and I need to go do something else. And it's not the same as a traditional goal fulfilling sort of work, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit more of a balance of asking yourself. Now I wanted to, this came, I laughed because this is what came in my email this morning. I'm on a daily listserv called TUT, which is uh, Adventures of the Universe, and I really like it, and I like most, but not all of this, but I want to read you the note that was in my box. Relax, Jules, enjoy, stop second-guessing yourself. All creative types require distractions, interruptions, and sometimes a little drama to get the most done and to blow the most minds. You are so where you need to be the universe. Now, I like that except for the little drama because as I've gotten older, I, I'm moving away from the drama. I don't want drama in my life, but what are your thoughts about that? You know, it's funny because chaos is part of creativity, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to be clear and balanced to know like, okay, this is chaos that's part of my process. This is chaos I don't need. And I think the more that you can yes. take that time, yeah, the more that you can take that time and realize that you know, there is a little chaos that's natural to the creative process just so that it kind of creates those, it's the gravel in your shoe. <laughs> it's, the, it's the gravel in your shoe that gives you the motivation to actually move forward and, and say like, wow, I can't wait anymore. It's time. I have to start, you know, my, I'm being drawn to create this. So I like the fact that, um, yeah, I, the, dra the word drama I don't really particularly like, but, you know, creativity and chaos I think is just be more, they're more of a partner Drama, I always think, like, you know, Housewives of Beverly Hills or whatever yes, the shows are. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> like, fake cattiness, all this stuff that just is a distraction, which is a good way to look at it because then you can say, wow, this is happening in my life right now. This is definitely something I know I don't need and is getting in the way of my creativity. So I think the more that you can be aware of your own drama meter, if you've got one, that actually can be really helpful. It's like, yep, this is something that is moving me forward. This is something that's not at all and it needs to be gone. I want to talk a moment about distraction because I find mm -hmm. a lot of us, not just with creativity, 
we use the distraction to not tap into our power, to tap into our creativity. Oh, I have to do this busy work instead of getting down to write the novel or to paint the painting. What, what, I'm sure you've encountered that when you've worked with people. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, I've encountered that with myself <laughs> as well. <laughs> not just other people, but with me. Um, you, you know, it's funny. I'll use myself as an example because I, I write two blog posts a week. And so for me, you know, I want to make sure, like, hey, I've got a little bit of a schedule. I know when I need to get the content created. But I don't necessarily have a set list of blog posts that I know I'm writing for the next week. It's just kind of like I have to be present and I have to sit with it. So I think when you're you're sort of in that busy work place, some of it is legitimate. Like you're like, hey, although I know I usually schedule myself to do these at this time, it's not really working. But if you see that you do that consistently over and over again, it's really important to ask yourself the bigger question, which is what am I afraid of? Mm -hmm. you know, what am I really afraid of here? And it, it really comes back to asking yourself because you have to notice the patterns in your behavior before you notice that you're even doing it. Um, but if you are frustrated and noticing that you're not getting anywhere, then yeah, the little mini goals can definitely help. It's just you have to be okay with, you know, if you see you're consistently not meeting them, digging in a little deeper and finding out what's up. Switching around that time. I do feel people need to experiment a little bit more with finding their peak creative time, so that might help a little bit and tweak that. Uh, but if you're consistently seeing that you're stuck, there's something bigger at play, some emotional issues and blocks that may be in the way of, of really letting you step into that creative expression. Now, I'd like to talk, you brought up being afraid, which I think uh, is very important, and the fear of failure. I think, again, if you're more aware that maybe that you feel that more intensely, perhaps, than other people. And, you know, an example I use is I met a guy, I actually had a crush on him, but it was like 20 years ago. I met this guy right after I graduated from college, and he was a writer, and he did the, is it the Iowa workshop that's like a, a pretty big deal, and was, they said, oh, he's, you know, an up-and-coming or whatever one of those awards were. And I was reading in Vogue, I think it's been nine months or so, I'm like, oh, my gosh. He, he's, he's now getting lauded. This was like his third novel, that, and it finally hit, but he kept with it. Now, the one interesting aside, I would say it was a very personal novel, which I think goes back to right to what you know or bringing whatever is personal to you out in your creative work, but he stuck with it. And, and 20 years later, I'm like, hats off that you stuck with it. But he, even though they weren't a New York Times bestseller right off the bat, he kept writing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's sticking with it is very important because it's about the practice. You know, it really is about showing up and being willing to to really kind of connect with that. And I also, you know, I'm I'm throwing this out there not necessarily because of what you and I do for a living, but every now and again you need an objective point of view. So if you really find that you are getting stuck consistently in one place, it it really is important and and not necessarily because you the answer is going to come from someone else. But having a reflective mirror to kind of show you where you're stuck can be very valuable. Um, I think people overlook that because they're afraid to admit, like, I'm really stuck here. Someone might judge me because this is silly and I, I can't explain why I'm stuck. And that's why people like you and I do what we do. It's because we can actually serve as a voice and sort of help reflect that back to people and help them get moving again. So there really is some importance to the objectivity to it. And if you don't want to hire someone, maybe you have a trusted creative friend or someone else that you can really use as a support system. Because sensitive people tend to feel like they've got to take it all on their own and do it themselves. Because no one else can really understand where they're coming from. But part of that creative process is that, yes, you do some things alone, but there is some collaboration in the sense of in the bigger picture, you're not going to get the book out by yourself. <laughs> there's other people that are going to have to help you along that line you know like you said before your mom and the paintings well what if she did want to sell them there's gonna be other people along the way that are gonna have to help you with that but you might not be able to explain very clearly what you need so there are helpers and people along the way that can really support you in your creative process and it's really important to understand that you aren't alone no matter what it is that you are excited about whatever you're creative about now, also about the fear of failure, I think that that's a big thing that we have and can really clutter your mind emotionally and, and mentally, but I feel a lot of times those failures, which I wouldn't call them that, because if you learn something, then it's not a failure, but can lead through a creative breakthrough. Do you have any... Yeah. Am I right? Absolutely. 
And, I, you know, the judgment, again, I'll go back to that word because I think that gets in the way of things. And I, when you can really kind of just keep with it and realize that, yes, this experience is happening for a reason that I may not fully understand, but you can kind of take it in and say, huh, all right, well, I was going to try that way. It looks like there is a big pothole. Can't really get across that right at the moment. What can I either learn from it or where, where am I really being drawn to next? Because I do feel that people see that the window's closed, which means that, oh, I'm wrong. I did this wrong. Especially when it comes to creativity. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, who's really telling you what the right creative path is? It's, it's where you're going next. So the more that your heart and your mind can be in alignment, so your heart is telling you, hey, this is, this is you know, something I'm passionate about. This is something I'm excited about. And then your brain is telling you, well, that's kind of lame. Why would you do that? <laughs> that seems really hard. You have to kind of find that balance between the two. And then when they both work together, but there's, there's no other person outside of you that's going to tell you that you're moving in the right direction. You have to feel it. That's, that's, that's what I think scares a lot of people about creativity, too, because it really is about getting to the feeling part of who you are and being okay with trusting it. There's no one's going to tell you this is the right way. You have to guide yourself and follow your own path to that place. And sometimes you're going to end up in a place that, like you said, has a roadblock. But it doesn't mean you did it wrong. It just means that, huh, this is new information. What am I going to do with that? Now, is there an exercise that you could lead us in maybe to clear some creativity clutter? I know that, you know, you would work with someone and specifically to them, but maybe a general one that you could offer that people might be able to use. Let's see. I actually just started playing with this idea the other day, and I haven't quite put it um, full. A list of your creative truths is a very powerful exercise is that this is what I believe about my own creativity and I think if you can look at that outside of yourself it can really be helpful in seeing where you need to work next size but obviously as with any exercise I would recommend people get some time outside or meditate for about 10 or 15 minutes before they start doing that um, and I would also encourage people to write the list and then leave it for at least 24 hours before you even take a look at it just kind of do the stream of consciousness writing thing and then leave it. Um, I, I think for a lot of folks, it's about, well, you want the results right now, but, you know, just moving some of that blockage just by writing down what you think is your creative strengths as well as your creative weaknesses, because your creative truth is both. It's not just one or the other. Then you can kind of really look at like, hey, this is, this is really what I'm feeling or thinking. What do I, you know, what do I want to do with that? Um, and then in addition to the clutter piece that we kind of already talked about before, I think it's extremely important to spend at least 15 minutes a day where you're tuning in, making it part of who you, what you do every day, and finding the best time for that, and making it part of your schedule. Because when you can start to introduce that, just like, you know, people that do morning pages, you'll start to see that even in times when you're not tuned in, stuff flows. It just kind of seeing that space and awareness. So those are two very uh, short exercises, hopefully. They were clear and, and made some sense, but I find that getting the stuff on paper as well as creating that regular space invites more space and more flexibility for it to come in every day. And I love how you say give yourself 24 hours before you look at it. I think sometimes we're like, have to have it, da-da-da-da-da, it's got to be solved now, and it's a process. And to not beat yourself up and be like, okay, you know what, I'm not going to wake up tomorrow and the grand novel is going to appear. Be like, okay, we start it and we do something and realize it's a mm -hmm. process. And that takes less pressure off of you, like, oh, gosh, have to come up with it, have to come up with it. Yes, exactly. And I talked a little bit about this similar exercise in um, a blog post that I'm working on too, so I can always refer you guys back to that if that sounds interesting to you, if people wanted to kind of actually have a written specific way to, to walk through that exercise. Now, is there anything else that I haven't asked or that you'd like to share that's really important uh, for clearing the clutter and creativity? Hmm. I would like to talk a little bit about the, uh, um, the health part because I know we talked a little bit about self-care, but what about looking at the foods that you're eating, the exercise that you're doing, like the physical part of, you know, because let's face it, we sit in a chair all day. That's not really very motivating. Like what, 
what kind of foods are you putting in your body or what kind of physical movement are, are you implementing in your day to help kind of keep that energy flowing too? Because that, I find that if I sit for too long, then I start to get sort of funky and stuck too. My, ener my creative energy also feels that way. So what are you, you know, it doesn't have to be a, an intensive exercise program, but, you know, even just walking before you want to sit down and write a little bit or however that works for you, whatever exercise fits in, and making sure you're putting in healthy foods too. Um, I have, because I'm a highly sensitive person, I can do caffeine once in a while, but I've got to be very careful with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how many people just feel like they need the caffeine to do the work, but if you, you need the, to charge up with all the coffee to write and then you crash later, you know, there's, you're setting your body up for sort of a negative cycle in that sense as well. I think that's an excellent point. Thank you for bringing that up because that's also, you know, you'll find people who are creative who say, I need drugs or alcohol to be mm -hmm. creative. It's part of my process. Whereas, you know, I think what you've recommended, good self-care and eating healthy is, is just, again, and the exercises you offered, that opens up space for the awareness and the creativity come in and it, you don't need the drugs or the alcohol or whatever for that. Right. <laughs> exactly. And you know that you I like how you said it it becomes part of they they become attached to that has to be part of their process. And so I think it's really important to look at well, you know, things that I could do when I was 19, I can't physically do anymore because I'm not 19 <laughs> anymore, right? I can't be drinking a bunch of caffeine and staying up till three in the morning and writing things. You know, right. that just after a while, that's really hard on your body. So yes, being mindful of what works for you now at the age that you are, and just because you've always done it a certain way, doesn't mean you can't change it. Yeah, because you know, I found a lot of people who are like, I have to be messy to be creative. I can't, mm -hmm. you know, if you organize me, then I will lose all my creativity and really hold strong to that belief. And again, that to me is is the mental clutter. Like, okay, no, we've got to switch that and, and let go of the clutter and, and you won't lose your creativity. Well, and how interesting they, get, they become attached to what that clutter represents for them, right? They yeah. get really attached to like, well, it has to be this way because then if not, what, how will I do it? <laughs> So, you know, and that's that's got to be really interesting on your end to see what someone walk through that process. You know, have you have you walked someone through that before where they started out really cluttered and they felt very attached to it, but then were able to sort of release that and, and step into a much healthier space? I have, and you know what? The more that they do it and let go, the easier it becomes. And it's just really mm -hmm. about taking that first step and then but also setting something up that's going to work for them because we all learn differently. We all do things differently. So it's finding out well, what works for them because what works for someone, person A, doesn't necessarily work for person B. And then showing like, okay, like here's the letter sorter that we can, so you still have all your projects, you know, or maybe it's like you, a folder system. There's something, but it's not everywhere. And when you have that idea, you can plop it in or you're like, oh, I'm inspired to work on this you grab everything and have everything you need. Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny. Like, I find that I'm drawn to a lot of systems that help me organize things by chakra color, <laughs> which sounds really funny, but I've always been really drawn to rainbow stuff. So that's why when I do my folder system, it's definitely colored fo folders, right? And it doesn't necessarily have to always be the basic ones, but I find that that, for me, because I'm very, you know, chakra oriented, that's how I make sure that I'm balanced all the time. That's the easiest way for me to think about it. So I usually do it based on those kind of colors too. But see, that works for you and I think that's brilliant. And it's, you know, if you're visual, you get all those clues and you found that it has worked for you. Now, I want you to tell everyone, your website, mm -hmm. you know, I know that you have like a, a creative, not creative crunch, tell it where you're like, if you're oh, stuck, call me and I'll talk to you half an hour, share all the good stuff you're doing and how people can find out more information about you. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, my website is creativekatrina.com. I do blog posts twice a week. So Mondays is a creativity kickstart where I give people a very specific suggestion for how to get through a particular block. And then on Thursdays, it's really more about general, general mindfulness on creativity and other ways to kind of help you move forward. Um, as far as if they want to spend some time with me, I have creative reflection calls for a half hour, and those are for $35, and I like to sort of just let people have an experience of what that's like. Like, what, what does it feel like to actually have someone actively listen? And if they want to do more extensive work with me, I can certainly, I have programs for that as well, so they can, 
you know, I can t talk with them in more detail about that at the time, but there's a lot of options because sometimes people just need a little support and sometimes people need a little bit more like, hey, I need writing, I need other aspects. So I can help them with both. Excellent. So Thanks again to My Wardrobe Genie for sponsoring today's show. My Wardrobe Genie is an easy, affordable way to organize clothes in your closet and make the clothing you want to wear easy to find in an organized closet when you want it. It means feeling good about what you select from your closet to wear each day. For more information, please visit allsetsolutions.com. And I want to thank my guest, Katrina Fancook. And again, it's creativekatrina.com. So if you've got some clutter in your creative area, go on and check her out. Thank you, Julie. Thanks for joining us on Clearing the Clutter Inside and Out. You can find out more about Julie Caraccio and her services at reawakenyourbrilliance.com. We'll see you here next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Remember, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step.